There you go. There's a URL for you to look up. All the source code for my demonstration project is here, and we're going to be spending most of our lesson, or most of the discussion, in that code. I don't have any slides. I haven't uh, prepared them, yet, unfortunately. So, let's, uh, I suppose, start with the big question. I want to keep this kind of informal, so I want a lot of input from the group. What do you know about Electron? Who, know, who here already works in Electron? You were two, two of you, three of you? Not you, not two of you. So these two probably know more than I do. Now, but you've probably heard of Electron. What is Electron? It is, well, maybe to see if we're talking about the same one. You can use the JavaScript, HTML, and CSS with Node to be able to build a desktop application that we want to do in Windows, Linux, and our Mac computers. Perfect. Did you everybody, everybody hear that well? So you're using your same HTML, CSS, JavaScript that you've always used for every web application you've ever written, at least for those of us who are web application developers, uh, which I hope is most of us. And you can uh, use the Node.js to write a desktop native application that can access the file system and do anything else that any native desktop application can do. Now, it's nice being able to do that in a familiar programming language because it's just annoying. And one of the great um, problems in, or that people face going into the industry is, well, shoot, you know, I want to get a job with this company, but I don't know the right language. I learned these 15 languages to do all this other stuff, uh, this language for desktop applications, this language for web. But these guys use something completely different. I mean, a personal example is, um, I wanted to get a job at The Void. Has everybody heard of The Void? You heard of The Void? So um, uh, I'm classically trained in PHP. And I've done everything I know in PHP, HTML, CSS. They use .NET. Well, I don't know .NET. Um, what about desktop applications? I, was, I know C++. Do they use C++? Well, actually, they do. They use, uh, but they use it within a framework called um, uh, Unreal. So I'd have to learn the whole Unreal framework to learn what the, the, just the basics of what I need to know to even apply. So, so, we're, so we're talking about almost two months of, of training, assuming I don't have a 9-to-5 job, just to be able to apply. So it's really nice that a lot of the different applications and all the different frameworks are being rewritten and changed so that you can use one language or a small subset of languages to do just about everything. Uh, it makes me very happy. So now that we know what Electron is, let's take a moment and talk about architecture. So. When we build an app in Electron, what, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work pretty much uh, following the same type of architecture as the Chrome browser uses. Is everybody's familiar with the Chrome internet browser. And the way that that architecture is set up is you have a process, a running app that is the backbone. And within that running process, you create child processes that represent the different windows, or in Chrome, tabs. Each child process of this main process is a tab within the browser. And you'll see that if you um, fire up your Chrome browser and load up two or three tabs with your favorite things and then go look at your process list, and you'll see a different process in your process list for each tab in Chrome. And that's because Chrome spins up a different process for each one. When you write a, an Electron app, that's the kind of architecture that we're going to use. So let's look at an example in a simple application that I wrote specifically for today's lecture. We're going to start in the index.js. Now, there's a lot going on here because I've been working on this app for a while. And please forgive me that it's not quite ready. But uh, we can at least turn it on, and it'll do something interesting. 
Uh, does everybody? Did it, did, okay. Um, it would be cool if, as, if many of you as have laptops here, if you could, um, if you have Node installed on your computer, you can do a uh, git clone on this repository, npm install, and get it ready to go. Because when we do turn it on, we'll want to all be attached. Because this is a real-time application that updates in real time, and I want you all to see the real-time updates as they come in, and it's awesome. <laughs> is that exciting? Questions? Oh, no, sorry. OK. All right. So if I got rid of everything else in here, the only thing that's important right now are these three lines right here. All right. Um, let's see. So. Um, installation, installation. So you have to NPM require Electron, obviously. NPM save Electron, get Electron installed. Is everybody familiar with that or do I need to go into that in a little more detail? Yeah, everybody's good with that? So NPM save install Electron. And then we'll go ahead and at the beginning line one const electron require electron. You just pull it in like any other library. Uh, let's skip gun and uh, the line three there. We're going to pull a couple of things off of electron using some ES6 syntax. So um, who's familiar with ES6? Most of us. Okay, anybody not familiar with ES6? Oh, more or less? All right. So on line three, it might throw you for a bit of a loop, but basically what that's saying is um, create a variable called app that's equal to electron.app, and then create a variable called browser window that's equal to electron.browser window, and then create a variable IPC main that's equal to electron.main. It's just a cool new syntax for doing the same thing with less code. All right. Now let's skip back down to line 25 where we're, where we're focusing. We're going to start with a basic on ready. If you've ever worked with, a de with a, trying to modify websites for like A-B testing, then you'll know that trying to, uh, and even just many websites, when you're trying to get the JavaScript to run and modify something on the page or interact with the page, you run into the problem with sometimes the JavaScript starts running before the page is finished loading. And in Electron, it's no different. We're building an app, and it's going to be running just like, a desk, uh, just like a browser window on our computer. And so if we start running our code before the app is ready, we're in trouble. So as the uh, Electron kernel spins up, it's going to emit this ready event to say, we are ready to start listening, and we're ready to start interacting. We're ready to actually run some code. So that's the first thing we're going to do. And then we're going to create a new browser window, and we're going to store it in this main window variable. Now, um, because I want the main window variable to be available in all other parts of my program, you can see up on line 8 that I've initialized the variable up there in the global scope. You don't have to do that, but that's what I'm going to do for this app. That way, any of these other functions that go on down here will all have access to that variable, that uh, main window. And then in the main window, we're just going to load a URL. And whatever URL we load, whether it's on our computer or on the internet, it's going to try to load it into that window and display. Now, let's see if I can get um, Mr. Jackson. Can I run this on your computer? Whoops, over here. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to do some tapping here really quick. Uh, where's that? Go to the main screen. Delete those extra 
characters. Does that mean it's done? CD into the directory. Oh, whoops. All right. Give that a second. Now, while that's working, I'll bring your attention really quick to the package JSON. Now in the package JSON, we're going to go to the scripts and we're going to add electron as one of the scripts and we're going to go electron dot as the value. So if I do an npm run electron, it's going to execute the electron app. Just like this. Sweet, I've got an app. It's a desktop app, and it's accessing the file system. That's pretty sweet. And that's only with the five or six lines of code that we've actually done. And we'll get into the rest of it later as we progress through the talk. Anybody have any questions so far? Did I miss anything? Is there, does everybody following along have your app running at least that far? I got an error. You got an error, what error did you get? No, go ahead. What is it? Uh, so npm install gun. Did you did you do uh, so npm install? Yeah, not gun. No. Well, gun should have been in the package yeah. JSON. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right, we'll get to gun in a minute. Uh, is anybody familiar with gun? He knows about gun. Who's it, who else knows about gun? A gun? You're an expert on gun. You do their web page? Excellent. Oh, you opened their web page? Oh, so now you know more about gun than I do? <laughs> Got it. Well, it's good to have good experts in the room, so you can correct me when I screw up on something. All right. Is that working now? Excellent. Now. Um, where do we go from here? And you can see there's a lot of uh, console output. When you, when you do a console log in the browser, it goes into the browser window. But when you do a console log in an Electron app, it's going to come out here on your, electron con on your uh, desktop console. Pretty simple. Works about exactly the same as you would expect. And in the app itself, because it is a... Uh, browser window. Where is the, there? It is. We have our developer tools. Isn't that beautiful? So all the debugging tools that we're used to working are all available to help us debug our app. Have you ever done a desktop app, or done a desktop application and wished you had those tools? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've done some apps where I was like, oh, if I could only just, oh, why can't I get a view of what that looks like? Everything that you're used to for pulling it apart and just taking it down to the nitty gritties on the, your developer tools is available. It's beautiful. All right. So let's come back over here and look at a few more fun things. Question, should we continue on the vein of uh, Electron for a few moments, or should we move into Gun? Gun. Gun. I just have a quick question on the actual. Okay. A very basic one. What is the cause? I am mostly with web development, mm -hmm. and I, I haven't played much with Electron yet, but my question is the following. What is the advantage of doing desktop applications versus doing a 
web application, the daughter suck is the same, uh, but it's able, you are able to access it with any device, any computer, anywhere because it's in the cloud. I don't know if I explain. Um, which part of that was the question? <laughs> what is the advantage of a desktop application create with Electron versus a web application? Lives in the web, mm -hmm. you can access it anywhere in any computer, any device, but the desktop lives in the desktop. What is the advantage of creating web app desktop applications? All right. Uh, let's um, answer, to answer your question, the question is, what is the advantage of having a desktop application that seems to be limited to just my computer versus putting the same code on the web, which can be accessed by the, you know, the World Wide Web in general and already works in every, brow in every um, computer because they're in browsers? Um, for security reasons. For security reasons? Yeah. Okay, very good. Can anybody think of any other reasons why it would be advantageous? Well, you pointed out is how you're accessing your local computer's file system, whereas when you're running in a browser, you don't get that same access. So the uh, application is able to do more when it's a native app that it can just for the browser. Exactly. If I can elaborate on that for just a moment. Um, the browser has a limit on how much data it can process for, a, for each um, browser window that's open, and that limit is five megabytes for in the local storage. If you're doing any app that needs more than five megabytes of data, you're going to start running into problems. And a lot of the desktop a lot of the uh, applications that you're seeing on the web, as they get more and more complex, they're starting to run into this limit, and they're starting to hit it hard. Now, when you have um, a properly built Electron app, you can deploy it as a web app, and then the people using the desktop app and the people using the web app both interact with the same data. Like right. Yeah. That's awesome. And another thing that you get access to, uh, let's see, who else had a, a one before I answer the question? Okay, so again, we're touching on the security reasons. Um, so excellent, thank you. Um, another thing that, that uh, an Electron app can do that a web application cannot do is the Electron app can actually use your rendering engines. It can use your uh, physics drivers, your uh, um, graphics processor. Your, the web, can, um, the web can only do that through an API, and uh, people have used it, if you've ever used Unity 3D, uh, or Op OpenGL, I think it is, through, yeah, um, to run at Unity 3, and it'll use um, your graphics processor, but it uses it through an API, through the web, and it's just very inefficient. Um, also things like if you're, if you're working with the um, canvas, HTML canvas, HTML canvas is going to try to do some processing, and processing that you think would be really simple is actually going to take it a lot more time because it doesn't have a graphics card to use. But when you're using an Electron app, because it's a desktop app, it's going to take advantage of all the resources the system has available, extra CPUs, extra RAM, um, the graphics processor, anything that, it ha that your system has available, it's going to use. Are you, are you talking about like using a native module to tap into the GPU driver or something? 
It just does. I mean, I think. I haven't gotten that far, but um, that's the way it was sold to me. So I haven't gotten that far, but I'm, hold that question, and we'll, maybe we'll get back around to it. Actually, it makes sense. You know, actually, I want to thank everybody because that was a legitimate question that I, that I, I hasn't even gone to mention yet because I said, like, why? But right now, I understand. You just remind me that Steam made me download something when I'm playing online anyways. And it makes sense because I have all the, when you play those games of first-person shooting, uh, I know when I'm playing all those games in Steam, I always wonder how is it possible that the web, the, 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 the browser can handle this this data because there is many players we play like uh, Ghost in the Shell, it's a very complex game that we play online with many friends, and, and now I see that it's pulling the resources, having access to the hardware of my computer, so it can run the graphics, but sharing data with the servers so I can play with other people. Bingo. Perfect. Exactly. So I don't, so. I, I don't want to derail anything, but uh, um, I don't. I don't think like anything you're seeing in this window is actually being rendered by Chromium, and so those yes. rendering, those APIs are the same as like this browser here. Even right. Even it's native mod. Oh, sorry. I won't derail. Go ahead. Well, no, you're right. It is running in Chromium. Chromium is doing the rendering. Right. Yeah. But there's no. There's no magic. Like you're not, your app's not going to magically speed up by running it on the top. It's it's the same. Okay, so there is a way to do it. It was sold to me that it could, okay. but I haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. So I know that it's possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's see. All right. So, uh, any more questions about Electron before I start talking about Gun? Say that again? So, like, is Electron's main target audience you know, web developers wanting to make desktop apps? Um, that's a good question. I would say that is a large tar part of their target audience. Um, really, it's, um, we're trying to pull back, pull back in the direction of desktop applications because of the speed and the power involved in having that, that kind of resource behind the app. Because uh, we've seen in the last 10, 20 years that uh, most of the, ba I mean, 10, 20 years ago, everything was an app on the computer. You had to download it, you had to buy the disks, and it installed on your computer to run on your computer. And as the web has gotten more and more advanced, all of those apps are starting to move online. So you don't necessarily download uh, and install an application on your computer to access your, your banking. But banking is one of the most important and, secu and uh, security prone to errors thing that you can possibly do. And it's all handled through web apps now because the, the technology has progressed that far. Um, and now we're starting to say, well, we've progressed really far in this direction, but let's take what we've learned here and pull it back a little bit, back toward the, the, the desktop application because we have that, those resources available and we're squandering them um, doing all of our work through web applications that only use, you know, a tenth of a percent of our CPU to run. So let's do something, let's, let's bring that crunching back into bear here, back to bear. Let's, let's actually do something that, do something meaty. With, and, and, but we want to do that without making everybody learn a new language. We, want, we don't want to make everybody relearn, again, a new language for um, writing programs on the desktop application. Yeah. Because this one is a language that it, most people who write web applications already know. If you look at uh, VS Code, right? It's an interesting one. Why would Microsoft, that already had Visual Studio, which people are paying thousands of dollars for a license for, why would they write an Electron app called VS Code that can do almost everything VS Visual Studio can do and give it away? Well, I don't know exactly why, but if you look at the community that immediately surround Electron, they inherited basically the largest open source community of programmers 
And the amount of plugins and the amount of people that jumped on Visual Studio Code would not have been accomplished in any other environment. So I think it depends a lot on your use case, and there's certainly a lot of use cases where it doesn't make sense. Absolutely. And I, had, I think I heard it said that every developer has touched JavaScript. So you're basically pulling on every developer in the world has had exposure to JavaScript. Versus, when am I going to do a pull request to C++? I, I don't know C++ yet, so I wouldn't, wouldn't try to do a pull request. Yeah. C++ is one of those fun beasts. I, I learned C++ in college, and most of us probably did, because they, they tend to try to sell that one as the beginner programming language. If you're going to start, you've got to start somewhere. Start with C++. I, I, no, I, would, I, would, I would teach people PHP first. Um, and you're going to laugh, but... PHP got its wide adoption because it is one of the easiest languages to learn. And that's really all it has going for it. As far as an advanced programming application, everybody knows it's not there. But it is easy to learn and easy to do something with and easy to make productive. And that's why people use it. So when you're trying to teach people of their first programming language, I would say PHP is a good one, good one to learn. But don't get stuck in it for your career like I did. <laughs> Um, which is why I'm moving in this direction of JavaScript. Well, ECMAScript, I should say, because we should really stop calling it JavaScript. What? Well, could I add an anecdote? So we decided to use Electron at my job um, because we had a pre-existing game. It was a Flash game. But everyone hates Flash. It's garbage, right? And the browsers are trying to kill it. <laughs> so, so we decided to wrap this, um, our, our game, in Electron. So we already have this product that's basically working, and now we can send it to desktop users, you know, put it on Steam for gaming, all those sorts of things. So it might actually increase, you know, our, our audience, and it's, it's super easy. Like, you just take that crap, throw it in here, and it works, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Excellent. So. Um, one, of the, one of the needs that arises when you start building a desktop application that with web-enabled technologies is you're like, well, uh, just like this guy here, I mean, wh at what point do we start interacting with other users? Or, or putting, how do we get that data off of our computer to everybody else? Right, are we stuck with just that desktop application? What, what do we do? Uh, one of the solutions, and my favorite solution, a pet project of mine, is GUN. And if everybody, anybody who's heard of GUN, it's a databasing solution. It's a graph databasing solution. Um, do you, has anybody heard that technology, terminology before? Graph databasing. Facebook. You know, graph databasing? Graph API, Facebook. GraphQL. GraphQL is a query language for graphs. So um, the idea with that is, uh, for those unfamiliar, let me just take a moment to, on a tangent. Uh, relational databasing program is a really high level database. You know, MySQL, Postgres, all those, those are high level relational databasing. And that makes certain assumptions about your data and requires you to create relationships between the data in specifically declared ways. And everything is tabular in, in nature and um, the relationships have to be coerced into this tabular structure. And a lot of times that becomes really crazy, especially when you have a, a large application, you start doing joins between 20 different tables to get all the data that you need. And who's done that? Who's had to write one of those joins? <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's nasty stuff. But you feel really good when you get it done, right? When it works? I feel like I've wasted time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it worked, and it feels good when it works. Um, <laughs> so you, you, you write that yourself. Sorry. Sorry. My time here is done. 
Um, so those are the high-level databases. As you, as you peel back the levels on databasing, you get to um, the likes of Mongo. Who's worked with Mongo? Okay. Mongo's a little bit easier. It, it relaxes some of those... Um, some of the restrictions on what you can put inside a cell. It doesn't have to, this cell does not have to contain a number and only a number. Now it can contain a JavaScript object, a JSON object with stuff inside it. Um, peeling that back down again to another level, you get Redis. Who's worked with Redis? Redis, we call it a key value storage engine. All it does is store keys and values. And you can build Mongo with Redis. You can build a relational database with Redis, but I wouldn't do it. Um, that's an exercise for the reader, right? <laughs> um, but you peel that back even one more layer down, and that's graph databasing. And graph databasing, all the data is represented as nodes at a very granular level. I have a node, and this node is Garfield. And he has an attribute owner that points to John. And John has an attribute called pet that points back to Garfield. Right? So I've created a circular structure. This one points to this one. This one points to this one. Now you immediately ask yourself, how would I represent that in JavaScript? Well, in JavaScript, that's easy. You can do that. But if you tried to JSON print that, what's the browser going to do? Circular reference just exploded in your face, yeah. And, and the same thing happens with all those major um, relational databasing engines is if you point this this way, you don't point back. You never do. Or you're going to get, you're, you get into real, you, know, you get into trouble really quick. You want to have one directional relationships. This points to that and that points to that and that points to that. But when you start having them point back at each other, that's when everything gets, goes to heck quick. Um, but in graph databasing, that's the core of what makes it work. This node points to that node, that node points back. And so if I requested on my node database, I said, give me John's pets, owner's pets, owner's pets, owner's pets, owner's pets, owner, it would return John. Because, and it knows what to do. It just bounces back and forth between those two nodes until it gets me what I want. So that's a graph database. Uh, Gun is a graph database and allows you to do that with a browser on, uh, in, a, in, a, in a browser on the web. So the data that's downloaded from the server onto the, uh, the data is downloaded, it's offline first. I'm going to say that first. It's offline first. So all the data is downloaded from the server to your browser when you load the application, which means that if the internet at that point explodes, and you are the only computer left online, as long as you have sufficient power, you can keep running the app because all the data is there. It runs in the browser. Is anybody familiar with Cap Theorem? Do I need to go into that? I probably shouldn't. Let's just stay away from that. All right, but um, the idea is it's, it's endlessly partitionable because everybody has a copy of the data, and it's endlessly available because it's right there. But the thing that sacrifices is the... Um, uh, uh, precision. And so with that, basically all you need to understand about GUN is that if I make a change in my browser and this guy makes a change in his browser, the GUN engine is going to look at those two changes and it's going to pick one to win and send that change to both people so both people will see the same thing. And the way it does is... Uh, it's, it doesn't have to be a complex. Um, I think they currently just use a lexical sort. Whichever one comes last in the alphabet wins. And it doesn't have to be complex, but it has to resolve to a, to a stable state that everybody sees the same thing. And so what GUN does for you is once you've made changes, those changes are sent Replicate, were replicated through the internet to everybody else who's looking at the app, all for you. You don't, have to, you don't have to write a single dot to make it do that. It just does it right out of the box. So any changes you make to this app are going to be instantly replicated to everybody else. How cool is that? You don't have to write that. I, I thought that was really awesome. How did, how did they talk to each other? 
throw a replication server. And you'll see right here, uh, line four, there's my replication server. And I spun that up in three lines of code. If you go to Gunn's web page, it'll show you how to do that uh, through the now servers. And so you just do a now server and tell it to uh, spin up a now server for free with Gun on it, and bam, you've got a Gun replication server. That simple. You can do it yourself. You can build it with Node. So you just build your Node application. It looks exactly like this. But you just load Gun in it, and then you have a URL to that server. And then in your desktop application or a web application, you just tell it where that Gun server is in that call on line four. And so it'll do all the replication through there. And we would love to be able to talk browser to browser and make it fully P2P. But unfortunately, the web doesn't work that way. WebRTC is still coming, but yeah, we're not holding our breath. Anybody from, did I lose anybody yet? Everybody still with me? Nods? There's snores, crickets? Huh? Try, trying, to, trying to process it all. I'm hitting you with a lot really quick. Uh, the, only, the, the important thing to remember is that Gun stores it as a graph, and it instantly replicates, and you don't have to do any extra code to rep for the replication, as long as you've got the server set up. And the server setup was like three lines of code. And that's all on their website. So we're just going to go on and talk about how Gun is actually going to work here. So once I've got my Gun installed, and we do npm install Gun, just like everything else, uh, we're going to go ahead and I, I used a suffix for this one because I was having some trouble, but you don't have to. Um, and then I create a new node called molap, a new node called player list within molap, and then within molap, a new node called holes and a new node called moles. So holes and moles. When I initially started, I had like 18 nodes, and then I've slowly peeled the peeled the layers off as I realized I don't need them. So this is actually the result of many months of work. Uh, OK, not months, but hours. Many hours of work, right? Um, so we're going to go on and discuss uh, the app on ready. So let's look at, at this a little bit deeper and just say, what do I do once the program runs? I want to display the please choose a username. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's look at the HTML real quick. Now, I, I just went and quickly buzzed through saying um, your uh, Electron app is going to load the HTML. And I didn't really talk much about what that HTML file has to look like. So let's look at the HTML file really quick. Now, ignore the fact that my styles are all in line still, because I haven't bothered myself to put them into a separate file. Here's the app. Looks like a pretty standard HTML web page, doesn't it? Because it is. That's the beautiful thing. But this might, this might throw some people for a loop. Who, who's, who, who, who cringes when they see? Um, require on a web page. Does that, make, does that make you cringe? You're like, no, you can't do a require on a web page. <laughs> yes, you can, because this is Electron. So we're just going to require Electron the same way we would do in a desktop application, the same way we would do in a Node app. Even though this is an HTML file, we have access to all the same APIs because it's on the desktop. And it's being rendered by the desktop by Chromium. So we'll just require Electron the same way we did in the other app. And on the Electron side, we'll pull off this thing called an IPC renderer. We'll look at that a little bit later. Uh, so the IPC renderer is something that we, uh, well, let me just quickly touch on that. The IPC renderer is called inter-something communication. Inter, I forget what the P is. But it's a, it's a communicator. It communicates between your, your different windows in your app. So I'll use that object to send data back to the main app. And then the main app will have an IPC main that it will use to send things back. 
So we're going to do some basic stuff to get, you know, basic uh, JavaScript app stuff. And let's uh, initialize our page. Let's see, whole elements, click the whole document, query selector, input on key press. That's this right here. When I press an enter code, I want to submit the form. Blah. And it does stuff. But how did it do it? Now blah is here. How did blah get here when it was on the other page? That's what we're going to talk about with the IPC renderer. It was sent by the app back to the main window for processing. And then the main window, after processing it, sent it back. And in fact, it actually not only went back to the main window, but it was then stored in gun, replicated through the internet to everybody else. And I see um, Billy, ba, Billy Bo Jim Bob has also done the same because he is now in my app. So when I signed up, that blah that I put in there was instantly replicated throughout the internet to everybody else and then sent, and then sent back from there to my main process and then communicated from the main process back to my main window and displayed. That's a lot of work. And it was only five lines of code. I'll show you. All right, so let's see. Button, advanced listener, Username is the document query selector input value. That's the same as any form you've ever seen on the internet. You just document query selector, the input, and get its value. And once you have that value stored in username, let's start the game. So we're going to console log ready. Let's do this. And we'll see that right here. That's a lot of logging. All right, it's lost in there somewhere. <laughs> Let's focus over here. So IPC renderer then send. IPC renderer send method is used to send data from your window back to the main process. And it's a very simple syntax. The first argument is an arbitrary, st arbitrary string. You're creating a new event that's going to be broadcast. So this broadcast event called username put, and you can put anything you want in there. I could say put a new username. I could say Joe's a crazy nutball. I could call it anything I want, but I chose this syntax, and it's a, it's a really helpful syntax, and it, it basically is noun colon verb. So noun is the object I'm working with, the colon, and then the verb is what I'm going to be doing with it. Username put. And I give it the username. So the next is an object of data that we're going to be sending. And that object can be arbitrary. It can have any number of things in it. Somebody send another mole? And I'll actually click it this time. You might run into a bug that I was working on fixing. I haven't quite gotten a handle on it. Uh, you can only send one mole per hole by clicking on the hole. But after you've clicked all seven, then you're kind of stuck, and you have to restart the app. I was trying to debug that, but I didn't quite get there. Once they're gone, they're gone. You got to restart the app? You got to change your gun suffix and restart to get the mole back. Really? Dang. All right, well, I guess I was in the process of debugging that. I didn't quite get there. Yeah, well, if you guys want to try that, go for it. Um, right now, I'm just doing the lesson, and so let's continue. So IPC renderer send, I send a username put and a username. So let's bounce back over to my index.js. Let's get that in a new tab so I can see those side by side. Uh, or at least without doing all the overhead of switching here. And let's see where I'm going to listen for that. There it is, right here. Oh, that's a wrong comment. You ever have that where you, you put a comment somewhere and then you change the code and you forget to change the comment? 
All right, so um, this is what we're looking at now. IPC main is the same thing, and we defined it up here, right there. We pulled that off of the electron object. And IPC main will use an on syntax, which we're familiar with with jQuery, right? On a username put event, run a function. And I could use arrow function syntax. I chose to write this one out, but if I wanted to do an arrow function, for those of us who love ECMAScript, oh, I can't edit here, sorry. All right, you can do that. I, I kind of bounced back and forth between the two and ended up settling just on doing regular functions just for my own sanity because I wasn't, something was broken and I wasn't sure what. Um, you ever have those moments? And I, w I was taught very early on that if you're trying new syntax and something breaks, go back to the old syntax and just suck it up. Oh, I missed it. Here, I'll send one to everybody. <laughs> All right. Let's see. On player, let's get functions. Uh, we were up here, username put. So, uh, IPC main on username put function. Uh, the first uh, parameter of the function that will be put in there for you is an event, and that's just the same event object that you're always used to working with, where the event target is the thing that got clicked on, uh, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada. Data is that data object that you define on the other one. In this case, it was username colon username, so whatever that username happens to be. Then uh, when I named my gun objects, my gun nodes, I prefixed them with a letter G so that I would know this was a gun object. So gun player list, get a session ID, which is just a random, uh, I think I chose a nine digits, random nine digit number integer that's generated when the app starts. So get my current session ID and put in that node a name, data username, I'll uh, give it a last action and a score. So it's going to go to that node player list, and then it's going to, from that node, get a new node. So get's going to create a new node or get an existing node. And it's going to use that session ID, that random integer I, I used to create a spot to create a new node. And then on that new node, it's going to add a name, an action, an action timestamp, and a score. And that's all I tell it to do, and that's it. Gun knows how to do the rest. So Gun will instantly take that, replicate that through the internet, and everybody gets that. Now we have to listen for the changes coming back from Gun. So we'll go down there and look at that really quick. Uh, or is it up? Here's my Gun listeners. Gun listeners. Here's there. That is, this one. There's my player list. So they've overridden map with their own function. So if you're used to map and you're like, well, that's a map, I know what a map is. Well, you're close. It's going to do a few extra things for you. Uh, when you do a map on a gun object, it is going to index over every object that's in that location, but then it's also going to set up a listener for you for free that will listen to any changes that are made and update you as they come in. So in this case, as soon as I sent the player list get and then put, put that new player in place, it's going to replicate that through the internet and it's going to come back here and gplayerlist.map is going to fire and say, I just got a new user. And it's going to have all that information on that node that I sent it and it's going to be coming in as uh, data. Now, it, it gets kind of confusing. The, the parameters are in reverse order here, whereas before we had the... Uh, um, the object, the event, and then the data. But in, in gun, it's the other way around. The data is here and then the key. The key is the, um, the vertex that I use to get to that node. So I'm on the G player list, and the G player list had to go through that random string that I generated, the session ID, to get to that player node. So that's what key is going to be. Key is going to be that session ID. 
So if the key equals session ID, that'll only happen when it's my user, if that session ID matches my session ID, if key matches mine. If it's me, then I'm going to go ahead and main window dot web contents dot send myself an update. So again, noun verb. So the noun is myself updated. And the object that I'm going to send is player data and session ID. So the main, and, and this, it's kind of weird. Electron is kind of weird in that the way to send it and receive it in different places has different syntax. And you just got to suck it up and learn it. And um, so here we have the main window. And I defined main window up, up at the top. And main window is a browser window. And by, by prefixing it, or by, by starting at the main window, you can see that in a larger app, when I have multiple windows going on, I can tell it which window I want to send the data to. So I don't just broadcast it to all of my windows. I can pick a window and send the data to the window that needs it. So to the main window, web contents, I'm going to send a new event that I created called myself update. And I'm going to send it that player data that just came back from gun. So switching back over here to my HTML, let's look for the listener for that, a myself update. Right there. IPC renderer, which came in from, IPC renderer, we defined at the top of our HTML document, is the thing for interacting with our main application. So IPC renderer, when I get a myself update, it's going to have an event and some data. And a console log, the app sent me an update to myself. What do I want to do with that? Well, let's just use some basic JavaScript. Document query selector, my info name, put it in there. Document query selector, my score, put it in there. There you go. So I have round trip, taken, a, taken information from me, from the user, sent it through the web, replicated it to the whole world, and then brought it back into my main process and put it back on my web page. Isn't that awesome? Mine's blown. <laughs> Questions? So what I can understand, correct me if I'm wrong. So IPC renderer is the, I mean, like, you can assume it as a person who constantly talks to all the uh, applications in the different windows? I mean, in, in this case, IPC renderer is a go between this window and the main app. Done by the gun thing, I mean, like gun talks to all the uh, application and replicates the, uh, I mean, like changes made to all the, uh, I mean, entire, uh, I mean, like the web, and takes the changes made by someone, someone else, and uh, shows to the window where the application is open, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. So okay. So uh, because the gun map, uh, where I did the gun mapping. The gun map is listening to all changes on the player list. So anytime somebody changes the player list, gun map is going to fire that and bring in that change and send it through here back to the, back to the window, and that's going to show up. So as people uh, come in, it's going to appear up here. It listens to the uh, entire like, changes. Right. Uh, some of them are here. Some of them have gone away. Uh, I tried to put a five-minute ex expiration timer if you haven't made any changes or, or made any interactions with the game after five minutes. It'll expire you and, and garbage collect it and get, get the user out of there. Um, didn't quite finish that, but uh, so you may have noticed your name pop up and then disappear uh, as, as the renderer renders. And how frequently are you listening in? Uh, is it like how frequently you are listening? So it will probably take the processing time if you are just listening. It's using sockets. So it's just, an, it's just a constantly open channel. And it just as it, as it receives updates, it just gets the updates. So there's no polling going on. Or if there is polling, it's uh, doing it. Uh, I, I think it uses long polling in, if, uh, if the sockets aren't supported. Good question. Uh, any other questions? Like, authenticate against it. Like, um, 
or, or even control changes, do you just always have to trust the client like this, or can you add like server-side logic to intercept changes and make sure that they're not doing stuff they should That's an excellent question. And that's uh, actually where the, the creator is working on that right now. And uh, so security is a big concern. Uh, at, at the outset, you know, as long as you're not doing an application, that, if, as long as you're not setting uh, secure data in there and you do appropriate checking on the d data that comes back. <laughs> Aren't they cute? Hmm. Let me see if I can whack one. <laughs> okay. I had to do it. All right. So, uh, <laughs> it's cute. Just a simple, uh, well, we should it was working properly. But anyway, that's your Mr. T. That's a lot of moles. You should be racking up score. Uh, Jordan's racking up the score. <laughs> All right. Where was I? Stop distracting me. It's too cute. <laughs> Uh, so when I got the, um, when I submitted that form, I could have just immediately updated my web page with that information. I didn't have to go round trip through gun. I round tripped through gun because I want a round trip through gun. I don't want to, um, nothing, everything rendered on this page is rendered because it got an event from the web server that, sh that displayed it. Otherwise, I would have to write everything twice, once to display it, and then once to change it when those updates came in. So rather than do that, I just wrote it all to just put everything on the page as the, um, as the updates come in. The, the only one exception to that is I put the holes on the page when, the, when, the page, when it renders. Other than that, everything else just comes in as it comes in. Um, the, the list will update, it should update at least, uh, I'm still looking at Bill and wondering why he's still there. But uh, anyway, like I said, it wasn't quite ready. I wish it was. Now that's as far as we've gotten now. Uh, where are we for time? That's one hour's worth of lecture. And uh, from, what, from what I understand, the person who was to come after me didn't show up or called to cancel, right? So we have time to play around with this uh, and do whatever we want or maybe learn a little bit more Electron. So let me ask you that question. Do we want to uh, step into some debugging on this application and just work on it as a group? Uh, maybe add some features to it as a group, uh, kind of a user controlled, we just work as a group and, and do stuff? Or would you like me to pop open um, some more uh, material on, on how to further develop the Electron app. Yeah, show some of the applications out there. You want to see an app? Slack. Slack is an Electron app. It gets information. Uh, it gets a user list. It has posts. And I'm sorry, I'm opening your personal stuff and I'll close it now, but I wanted uh, an example. All right, um, so Slack is a great example of an application where um, they have both a desktop client that you can install and a web client. Because everybody sent you a Slack link and it opens up Slack on the web by default. And then you can use that to open up your desktop application and open the same window once you've been registered with the server. As Slack is, Maybe not the best example because it's a little bit kind of all over the place. Um, There's one uh, that it helps for photo and UX design. It's called Avocado. And it's really helpful for image manipulation and all that stuff. It's really interesting. It's built on Electron as well. Sweet. So an image manipulation app. Um, has anybody used Discord? Discord's an Electron app. Uh, Twitch, the curse launcher that became the Twitch launcher. That's an Electron app. So Etcher is kind of a cool one because it's an Electron app that uh, utilizes Electron's ability to interact on a very, like, uh, uh, interact with your actual operating system a lot because it's 
it's an electron after burning USB drives like ISO USBs. And so it's built in electron, but it's interacting with the drives on your computer, which is kind of cool. So. Nice. Okay, so uh, a disk storage and management solution, why not? Electron can do that. Anything a desktop application can do, Electron can do. I use uh, Mongo Compass and Visual Studio Code. Mongo Compass and Visual Studio? Which one? Brave. A browser that you built. Not me, you're not me. The guy who made JavaScript. Okay. The guy who made JavaScript. Yeah. He wrote his own browser. Yeah, he started a new company. It's really based on, or focused on user privacy and you um, have lots of new defaults and stuff. Sweet. So a browser named Brave is built on Electron. So a web browser. You can do that. A web browser that is a desktop application and can access all of your files. That's kind of a scary thought. I mean, we, we grew up with the whole security model of you know that if that app is running in your, app, in your web browser, it can't touch your file system, and you love that separation. And now we're getting rid of it. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's true. So it, it, there is a big onus on the people writing the Electron apps to make sure that they take steps towards security. All right, so um, the next topic on gun, or not gun, um, oh, so the next topic with gun is security, and the next topic with electron is how to manipulate the, um, the menu. Uh, votes on which, who wants to do which one? Who, who wants to go into gun security? Who wants to see how to change the menus in electron? Oh, come on, that was weak. All right, once again, gun. Uh, four, and electron. Five, okay, good enough. All right, so I might have to look up some stuff because this is, this is where I was in my training, and I was going to put some of this in this app, and I didn't quite get there, so please forgive me while I just load up my tutorials. <laughs> Uh, wait a second, I'm not you. Um, I'm not afraid. Okay. And I, I just need this, I mean, I know how to do it, but I just need the syntax. Uh, if anybody's familiar with Udemy, highly recommend it. I uh, really love it. Um, if you're out, sorry to see you go. Thank Have a great day. All uh, right, where is my apps? Looks like I'm not logged in. There we go. So we're just gonna jump back a little bit to constructing menu bars. Just to look at the syntax. All right, so there's the syntax. So we're going to go ahead and create a menu template, and that's just a JSON object. And in that JSON object, we'll add some labels. And within each of these labels, we have a number of properties that we can set that, de that determine what the app is going to do. And then we, we, once we've got that menu template, then we'll come up here, and on line 11, you see the main menu, build from template. And then there's one more line that he's going to add. Let me see if I can jump ahead to that. There it is. Menu, set application menu, main menu. 
Now, I, I, the initial reaction I had when I read this is, why is that two different lines? Why can't I just set my menu in one command? And the reason for that is because different windows might have different menus, and different interactions from the user might cause the menu to change. So they have it separated out this way. So at the, at the onset, menu, app, set application menu, the main menu, sets that menu, but then you can come in later and say menu, set an application menu, submenu, or menu th two, menu three, menu five, depending on whatever needs to happen. And then just having a label is not the most interesting thing, but it's a good start. The next property we'll put under it is a click event handler. So we'll do just uh, so you'll comma, and you'll come down to the next line and click, parenthesis, parenthesis. I wish I could type on these, but I can't. Uh, I'll, I'll let him do the typing for me. Hey, look, a submenu. There's still just labels right now. All right. There's a little more to it now. Um, oh, he just added that if process. So uh, if the process platform is Darwin, then that's the signal that you're on OS X. Uh, there's, a, there's a bug in the menu on OS X where you can, the, the first one that you set gets ignored by the operating system because the Apple counts. So um, you, have to un, you have to do a menu template on shift to get the Apple out of the way I mean, the apple will still be there in the corner, but it moves the pointer for the menu over so that you can actually start adding file menu and thing like that. That was one of the gotchas. But right now, there's still just labels. There's the first bit of actual do something. So I've created a label called a file, and then it has a submenu. When I click on it, it's going to open a submenu. And within there, there's a new to do. That's the first object. And the second object is a label quit. And on that quit, I'm going to put on a handler, click, and call app.quit. And that will close the application. Makes sense? So we can add it. the click functionality can do anything in the world we want it to do. And, it can, and it will, even later, we'll see, we'll see what parameters go into that. Uh, the first parameter that you get from the click is the event, and the second parameter that you get is the focused window. And that's important because if, you're, if your menu is, if you've got the menu on three different windows here, and you access a, web, uh, a menu item and, and choose it, which one is it going to run in? So the two parameters to that click, the first one is the event, and the second one is which window is focused, and that just comes in as an object. So I can say window, whatever window object that happens to be, dot send some information. And I can send a, send a request to it, send some information, send an event to it. Is that making sense so far? Am I going too fast? All right. Um, the next thing that we want to look at with uh, menus is hotkeys. Once we've overloaded the menus and started building our own menus, all the hotkeys get blown away. We're doing our own menu. We've got to set everything back up. So they'll add a new one underneath label called an accelerator. And the accelerator is a syntax for adding those hotkeys back in. So let's see here. There's the accelerator. Command Q. If you're working on a Mac laptop, which the guy who was doing this uh, tutorial was using, 
Command Q is the control for is the command for quitting. Now, obviously, if you're using Windows or if you're on a Linux um, machine that doesn't have a command key, that's going to be a bit of a problem. Well, we'll see how to handle that in a minute. But uh, that's the syntax for adding an accelerator, basically a hotkey, for executing whatever that command. And that whatever is in that click handler is going to be executed when you ex when you do that that uh, key syntax. And you can do anything you want in there. You can do command plus alt plus Q, uh, command plus alt plus J, or alt plus command plus J. As long as it's all there with the plus, uh, chained together with the plus, then it'll work. Still with me? Now, we don't have to just settle for a value inside that accelerator. That accelerator can point to, in this case, an iffy he's going to build. You're all familiar with iffies? So he just takes whatever that, um, whatever that accelerator is going to point to and encloses it in parentheses and puts the parentheses on the end to immediately invoke that function. And then inside, he can do anything he wants. And whatever is returned by that function is going to be what value that get accelerator gets. And so he's checking to see if the, process, if the platform is Darwin or if we're OS X, because the, the underlying code base underneath OS X is called Darwin. So we're checking. Are we on OS X? Then return command Q. In any other case, let's do control Q instead. Easy as that. And when we do control Q instead and, we act and run the app, oh, and then he's going to say, yeah, there's an easier way. Instead of writing an iffy, just do a ternary. kind of feels silly just parroting somebody else's tutorial. Is any, does that bother anybody else? Uh, creating separate windows. Creating separate windows is actually pretty straightforward. Um, just use the syntax that we use to create the main window and just create more variables, create more windows. Uh, each one of those windows will have its own IPC renderer that will send information back. And the application that we started with has uh, its win uh, you, you use the variable that you created to, to, to hold that window to send things into that window. And then you just use the same IPC system to send information between the various windows. So if I have something in window A and want it to be in window B, then I use the IPC to send it back to the main process and then from that main process it back to the window. And I, so it's, it's a lot the same as what, I do, uh, as what I do with Gun, but instead of going back through the, the main server alone, I go back to the main server and then out to the web, to the replication server, and then back to my server and back to the window. So it's just the same thing, except you go in from in one window and out the other window. Does that make sense? Um, let's uh, look at the M. So if I went back here and looked, at the beginning, I think we're up here. This is the HTML. Where I create my main window. All I have to do to create a separate window is create more windows. So I, instead of main window, I'll create window two, window three, window four. Um, or if you want to be more creative with your naming, um, if I wanted to have a window that pops up to add a new mole, for example. And then I would call this the add mole window. And then I would come, and then the syntax here in lines 26 and 27, I would just say add mole window equals a new browser window and add mole window load a URL. And then instead of index HTML, I'll just create another HTML file for add mole HTML and it just has a different form in it but all the same syntax applies. Everything we learned on the first window applies to the second window. And then when the second window sends me some information, I'll just do a um, on listener, the same as I did before. 
IPC main on, uh, new mole, for example. So mole new, uh, here's mole wax. So I do an IPC main dot on mole new. So I'm getting a new mole and I'll have the function event data. And we can use that event to identify where it came from if we care. Uh, mostly we just care about the data. So once we got the data from that little window, then we can do something with it. And if we're sending it back to the, back to the window, do I have any, then we'll, instead of using main window.webcontents.send, then we would use the um, add mole window.webcontents.send. And then that will send the data instead of to the main window, it'll send it to the moles window. So that way we can have two windows and we're talking to both, both windows. Um, I feel like I just said the same thing twice and, tw and uh, ate up 10 minutes of time doing it. Um, is, that, is that clear for everybody? All right, that's as, uh, that's as far as I've currently gotten in learning Electron. And that's pretty deep. Okay, maybe it's not. But uh, quest questions that far? Can this be used on an Android app? Yes. Yes, it can. Uh, somebody took the time to go ahead and research that and build a boilerplate for building Electron apps that has a compiler built into it where you can run the compiler to build an EXE for Windows, a JAR for everything else, um, or compile it as an app. And let's see if I can find it really quick. There it is, perfect. So this um, Electron boilerplate, you just clone that boilerplate and install it and it builds a basic um, Electron app. And then you can take, so if I was gonna do this boilerplate with my gun code um, or my other app, then I would just install his boilerplate, go to the place where I installed it open up his uh, index.js, and then just replace it all with my index.js. Easy as that. So that's, that's how you'd use that. And then it shows how he has it all set up to compile that into apps. And there, there's some tutorials here. So there's, a, there's something for you to check out. I did look at that briefly. Good question, excellent question. Other questions? You have a question? No. Oh, you have to head out? Okay. Uh, I hear a lot of zippers going on. I, it seems like uh, everybody has agreed that I've talked long enough. Um, so do we want to end it there or do we want to do some more work on this? What do you think? I think it would be good to end it, but you can still answer questions. Absolutely. Individually, it would be good. All right. So we'll just end that here then and uh, call that a lesson. Thank you very much.